Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to each of you. My name is Shanti Lopes, and I am the Assistant Director for Communications and Engagement at the Education Trust in Massachusetts. Your presence here today fills me with a lot of gratitude as we gather to tackle a topic that is both pressing and fundamental, the state of literacy here in Massachusetts. You may have noticed that often when this conversation is brought up, the word crisis accompanies discussions on this matter, and rightly so. That is because being a proficient reader is, is about way more than just a, having a skill. It's a gateway that unlocks knowledge, empowers voices, and fosters critical thinking. However, despite its profound significance, the reality in Massachusetts is that only 44% of third graders are meeting critical literacy benchmarks, and the outcomes are even more concerning when you dig deeper into the data. So where do we go from here? How do we ensure that all students in the Commonwealth have the fundamental literacy skills? How can we forego a path that ensure that all our students are equipped for, for success? We believe that that journey begins with a thorough understanding of the landscape, really comprehending both the challenges that we face and the opportunities that lie ahead. And that's precisely why we're here today, to glean insights from parents regarding their perspectives on the literacy crisis, the impacts that it has on children, and what measures, resources, and supports they believe are necessary to combat the decline in literacy proficiency. Additionally, we'll seek expert guidance on actionable strategies to confront this uh, challenge head on. To move forward, we believe that this is a collective effort and your presence here today uh, shows us that you're dedicated to this cause and for that we are thankful. Together, drawing from uh, the wisdom in this room and committing with action, we can make meaningful change uh, towards a brighter future for all Massachusetts students. Quickly, a little bit about the Ed Trust. We are a data and research-driven organization that is committed to advancing policies and practices that dismantle the racial and economic barriers embedded in the education system and build a more equitable system where every child has the opportunity to succeed and thrive. Most importantly, we believe that that can only be done in partnership with community leaders, with students, and with families, especially with those that have been underserved for far too long, to really ensure that their perspectives and their experience are front and center when critical policy decisions are being made. And in the spirit of uplifting community voices, we collaborated with the Massing Polling Group this spring to conduct a statewide poll of parents uh, in grades four to 12 we asked parents a variety of questions specifically on literacy. This yielded some really interesting results, which we will explore with you all today. This was a 10th uh, wave of polls, which began with the Mass Inc. at the onset of the pandemic, thanks to the support of the Bar Foundation. I also want to acknowledge and express gratitude to many of our partners at the Massachusetts Educational Equity Partnership MEEP, many of whom I see on the call today, who are really instrumental in helping us shape the poll. Before we get started, I want to go over a few logistical um, a few logistical notes. If you have any questions throughout the event, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A function, and we will be sure to carve out some time later on to get to them. In addition, we will be recording the presentation as, as well as sharing the slides, um, so be on the lookout at both the Ed Trust in Massachusetts and the Mass Inc. Polling Group's website. Now I'm sure that you're all looking forward to digging in. So before we do, just want to give you a little bit of insight into what you should be expecting from our time today. We're excited, we are excited to kick things off with the remarks from Senator Sal Domenico, who will share his perspective on the literacy crisis and an overview of the state of literacy in Massachusetts. Next, we will dive into the poll finding with a presentation from Steve Cogzella, president of the Massing Polling Group. Afterward, we will shift our focus on a conversation to discuss what comes next, highlighting promising efforts and initiatives underway in Massachusetts, along with potential policy solutions to address the, the crisis, moderated by Mandy McLaren, a Boston Globe reporter on the Great Divide team. Now it is my distinct privilege to introduce our first guest speaker, Massachusetts State Senator Sal Domenico. Sal Domenico has represented the communities of Cambridge, Charleston, Chelsea, and Everett in the Senate for 14 years, and currently serves as the Assistant Majority Leader. Most importantly, he is a tremendous champion for educational equity, including leading legislative efforts to improve Massachusetts early education and literacy outcomes, 
We're extremely grateful for his leadership and are excited to hear from him today. Senator Domenico, the floor is yours. Hello, Shanti. Hello, everybody. Uh, my, my video is not a lot, not going on. It says at the, oh, there we go. Let's see what that happens now. There we go. Okay. Good, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. I want to thank everyone for having me today. This is a very important issue, as it was mentioned. And there's so many things that are happening in this space right now at the state. Um, and I'm excited about it because we have not had this discussion about literacy and in quite some time. Um, as many of you know, I've been a state senator for 14 years, and I've been focusing on issues that affect children and families during my entire career, uh, with anti-poverty issues, with food and security issues, universal school meals, breakfast after the bell, uh, the child tax credit, um, the look bill, which brought bilingual education back to our communities and throughout the Commonwealth. Um, it really takes a holistic approach to tackle issues that are important to our students in our classrooms and outside the classrooms, quite frankly, as well. Uh, but literacy is an issue that we can really do amazing things with. And we're at a place right now, we're at a critical juncture um, of seeing how we would take this to a, a different level. Um, so it wasn't really a, a big leap for me to get involved in this space when I saw uh, inequities uh, that I saw across the, my district, across the Commonwealth, and really how our kids are uh, you know, learning to read and proficiency levels across the, the, the gamut of the Commonwealth. So, I, you know, we all know and we've all heard many experts on this call and people that are watching know that a third grade, uh, third grade markers are critical for success of our students going forward academically. And we also know that uh, we don't have that time to go back and do the right thing to make sure we give them this, this you know, tools and skills they need to be successful going forward. Um, when you think about the benchmarks, and as Ashanti mentioned, you know, we're not meeting benchmarks. ELA benchmarks are not being met. Outcomes are worse for Black and Latino students, uh, students with disabilities, ELA learners. Um, and during my time in office, that number has not really risen significantly across the board. And uh, we had some small increases, but then they went down again because of COVID. But really, you know, this is not something that's been sustained uh, throughout some time. You know, in my own district, I also have this, the same issues that are happening across our Commonwealth. So I decided to uh, look at the issue and, and we filed a bill on this issue and we filed something that would, in my mind, uh, make things better for our students, give teachers the support they need in the classroom. And also, you know, being a teacher today is is difficult. My, wife, my wife's a teacher, my wife's an educator in special ed. And, and I know how difficult that is. And I know the tremendous strain and demands that are on our teachers today. And, you know, they have a lot on their plate. Uh, so we're trying to give them tools that they can use in the classroom to to help them and help the families they serve. So, you know, it's not, it's not, a, not rocket science in my mind to provide support and provide evidence-based uh, curriculum in our, student, uh, in our student population and make sure that all of our kids are getting you know, what they need to succeed going forward. And, you know, it's... Um, you know, this isn't the case in all districts that have that kind of instruction level, instruction in the curriculum. So we're trying to make it a little more um, equitable across the board. And there's not a one size fits all approach to this. We know that. And that is not something that I'm trying to trying to do here. Uh, there are definitely um, things that other districts and other schools and other populations might want to use. It, well, all we're saying is evidence based. It has to be a standard that's met across the board. So. Um, when I hear we're trying to, you know, pigeonhole people and we're trying to make them do a certain thing that they may feel uncomfortable with, that is not the intent here. That is not what we're doing with this legislation. Um, we've also filed the budget amendment, as many of you probably saw, uh, with increasing the literacy funding in the state Senate budget and with putting language in there that says exactly what I just said, evidence-based curriculum to be used uh, in our district. So um, we know parents... Um, and we know families have not always had a seat at the table, and we know that uh, some parents don't have the time to get involved in their students' academic 
success because they're too busy working two or three jobs, quite frankly, and trying to survive and put you know, food on the table, trying to stay in their homes. And that's where we come in as government. Um, that's where I come in to represent the people that don't have a voice or don't have time to come up and advocate for themselves and do what we think is right for them and their families and make sure we stand up for them because it's too important for these kids not to be on the same par as everyone else and no one left behind. So I'm very happy that we have this poll today. Obviously, we know and we saw what we, we thought was gonna what was gonna be that the case. Um, you know, about a third of all parents are concerned about their child's reading progress, and that number jumps significantly. Significantly, we're talking to parents of color and parents of low income uh, background. So uh, I'm excited about the panel discussion today. I want to thank the Education Trust and Mass Inc. Um, along with uh, all my colleagues in the Senate who have been supportive of this. Jason Lewis, my chair of education, has been uh, been a, a strong supporter of this as well. So looking forward to a, a great discussion. Looking forward to uh, getting the work done in this space to make our families and our children get what they deserve. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for your powerful world, words and reflection and, and for uplifting, again, the importance of, of getting the perspective of um, parents and families. Um, it's really encouraging to hear about some of the uh, progress that's been made and also the opportunities and initiatives that are underway. We stand ready to advocate um, and look forward to continuing to work with you and the legislators to support your vision for a more equitable future for all students. Um, on behalf of the Ed Trust in Massachusetts and Massing Polling Group, um, thank you for joining us today as well as for your leadership. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Steve Cogzella, president of the Massing Polling Group, who will share some of the key findings from the poll. Steve, the floor is yours. Uh, and thank you, Shanti, and uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm gonna be sharing the results of a survey that we did of uh, K-12 parents across Massachusetts. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so that we can walk through some slides that show, show some of the key, key highlights. Uh, so you should you uh, should now be seeing a slide presentation, Massachusetts Parental Insights on Early Literacy. Um, and I'd, I'd like to begin just by giving you a quick orientation to what the survey actually is that you're looking at, when we did it, who we talked to, and that sort of thing. Um, the survey is of just over 1,500 Massachusetts parents, and it's done with uh, done with uh, of parents with children range, ranging from uh, K through 12. And like all of the polls in this series, which now goes back all the way to May 2020, we have oversamples of Black, Latino, and Asian parents across Massachusetts. And you'll see as we walk through the slides why that's important and the nuance that it allows us to dig into. Uh, the survey was done in, in April and May of this year in, in, in uh, English and Spanish. And the next bullet is just to say that you should see it as being representative of parents on age, gender, race, education, and region. And you'll also see a couple of references to focus groups. And as we go through the slides and some quotes from focus group, group participants, we have often done groups just to dig in more to the issues that we're exploring in the poll. And we did that here with three, uh, with three focus groups as a part of this. Um, and just a big thank you to the Education Trust and also the, for the, to the Bar Foundation for the support that they provided for this entire series. These slides are going to be posted on our website at massingpolling.com, uh, so you can go there and look at them as, as uh, you have time and as you're interested. I'm not going to spend a whole ton of time on some of them just because there's a lot of data to get through and I only have about 20 minutes. This key finding slide is one of them just because we're actually going to dig in more to all of these numbers. But as I do zoom by some of them, just know they're all there for you to dig in, um, dig in on the slides and also the top line and also the cross tabs. If you're wondering, you know, is this broken out by some demographic group you don't see? Probably it was, and, it, and it's all that data is going to be posted on our um, on our website again at massingpolling.com. Okay, so the moment you've been waiting for, let's get into the actual data. As we're going through this, I draw your attention to the fact that here at the bottom of the screen, the question text for the charts that reflect uh, questions from this poll are shown here. And for instance, the question that, that is the basis of this, this pie chart is, to the best of your knowledge, is your child reading at the level expected for students in their age group? And you can see that by and large, parents think that their children are reading at the level expected for students in their age group. 80% said that, uh, just 15% said no, they're not. And we have, um, as a bit of a contrast to that, we've got um, 
a chart here on the right, which shows the percent of third grade students who are meeting and meeting or exceeding expectations in ELA MCAS. And you can see the overall number here in orange is that 44% number. And you can see um, numbers that probably many people on this call are familiar with, which is that there are some disparities when you break out these numbers by, by the race of the students. Um, moving along then, what this one is, is the level of concern that parents express about their child's reading progress. Overall, we see the top set of bars here, 31% say that they're either very or somewhat concerned about their child's reading progress. Um, we see that there's more concern among parents of color. That's what these bars here represent. And that's why that oversampling I mentioned is very important as it lets us do these kinds of breakouts. We also see that among parents who don't think their child is reading at their expected level, not, uh, probably not surprisingly, concern is very, very much higher at around 80%, saying they're either very or somewhat concerned. And also parents who say that their child has had a dyslexia diagnosis. There too, you see very high levels of concern about their child's pr uh, progress in reading this year. Um, what this one was, was that it was when parents said that they're concerned, the, the, the follow-up question was an open-ended question. And, um, the, and it was basically just what concerns you about your child progress, child's progress. And you can see that overall 27% said something related to their, just the fact that they think their child is behind grade level. Um, so the, the next, uh, the, the next most frequent set of comments was mentioning some specific thing, like perhaps spelling or comprehension, um, issues with the curriculum and so forth. But this is where parents could say anything. And then we read through the, uh, you know, the thousands of comments that we got on open-ended responses and just grouped them into categories. So here are some examples, for instance, of those, of, of those open-ended responses. You can read the words perfectly. The comprehension and putting the story together overall is where he struggled, struggles. Or I'm just concerned that my child's not progressing the same as other children in their grade, and I want them to be ready for the future. You can also see how these broke down across demographic groups and the crosstabs, which, again, are just posted on our website. Um, so by and large, uh, we found that that parents are mostly thinking the child is at the expected level where they should be, and that their child, their school is doing a pretty effective job, either a very effective or somewhat effective job at teaching their children to read. So on this slide, for instance, the top set of bars shows that 89% of parents think their, their child's school is either doing a very effective or somewhat effective job. And we can see white parents are a bit more likely to think that, that the school is doing an effective job. And the uh, bars in the bottom, parents who think their child is reading at the expected level mostly think, yes, okay, the school is doing an effective job more so than the next set of bars. But if you add together the very and somewhat effective numbers, even uh, parents who think their child is not reading at expected level, by and large, think that the school is doing a very or somewhat effective job. And you'll see it as we move through the next um, bunch of slides that in many cases, parents just aren't aware of the level of the, the level of, um, of the number of students who are not reading at the level that would be expected of a child of their, in their age group. Uh, also, they're also by and large, um, not super familiar with a lot of the reading concepts. You know, we asked about these in the focus groups as well. We asked about them in the poll just to kind of understand, you know, what parents know, what ideas are parents familiar with? Have they heard of the concepts you know, listed on this chart and found that this sort of bluish green bar here is the percent who said that they're very familiar and the lighter bar here is the percent who said that they're somewhat familiar. Um, the most familiar concepts are sounded out, sight words, phonics, etc. Um, the least familiar are cueing. The least familiar one is cueing, which again you'll see kind of coming up here in a little bit. Because we did these oversamples, we were able to then break out who said they were very or somewhat familiar with each reading tool. And that's what this chart here shows. Um, the, the percents here are, should look familiar from the previous chart. They're the very or somewhat from the previous chart. But then you can break it out between white parents, black parents, Latino parents, and Asian parents. And the thing that stood out on this particular question was that black and Latino parents were more likely to say that they were familiar with reading approaches that are not evidence-based. I'm looking down here at these, bo these, these bottom four, for instance. 
Uh, mostly parents aren't aware of which approaches are proven to be effective to support reading. Um, we basically asked, is it phonics? Is it cueing? With these descriptions you see here on the screen, is it a combination of both or, or don't know? And just 29% said that they, that or 29% chose the option saying that phonics is the most effective method, while the remainder either said cueing or the most common response was just a combination of both. By and large, parents are also not, not aware of the level of the literacy crisis here in Massachusetts. The question was, how much have you heard or read recently about students in Massachusetts scoring below grade levels on reading tests? And we see just 13% said that they've read a great deal, 24% said a fair amount. Um, this question, I think, is very useful just because, you know, the closer you are to an issue, it can seem like everybody's focused on it and everybody understands it. Um, but throughout the poll, and particularly in this question, I think we're reminded that this just is not an issue by and large, which has been on parents' minds or which they've read a whole lot about and um, heard or read a whole lot about in the news media or elsewhere. Um, then you can see basically the same question broken out here, and you can see that there's not really a group who where there's tons of familiarity. Um, black parents were a bit more likely to say that they heard either a great deal or a fair amount. Uh, that's these two sets of bars right here. But overall, uh, there's there's a lot of just a littles, nothing at alls, and don't knows. So um, definitely not a ton of a ton of awareness and familiarity with with what's been going on. When we, uh, we then offered some information in, the, in a couple questions, which you can see here, uh, how we kind of phrase them at the bottom. And again, all of this is posted on our website, so you don't have to try to um, zoom through it as, as quickly as you can. Um, and then just ask basically, how concerned are you about, for instance, the use of queuing? Or how concerned are you about overall students' reading levels if you know that, parent, that half of students are not reading at expected levels? And you can see that particularly the second one, that half of students are not reading at expected levels, you see there almost 80% say that, say that they're either very concerned, which is the first set of ours, or somewhat concerned about, about that when you uh, describe that, that level. What's also interesting is that concern is very evenly distributed. This isn't something where, you know, what we've seen on many education issues over the years where there's big differences um, between white parents and black parents, for instance, or Latino or Asian parents in terms of how they're reacting to what's going on in schools or some, you know, particular policy proposal or something like that. On a lot of the questions in this survey, and particularly this one, there's very little difference in terms of um, how concerned parents are when you, you know, describe the fact more than half of students in Massachusetts are not reading at expected levels by third grade and so forth. Um, so the question here was basically, okay, for those who have heard something, what have you heard? And here we did see the idea that reading scores and levels are behind pop out as the top issue. Um, we also saw COVID impacts pop out. That's something we've also heard a lot about in the focus groups, just as something that's of concern to parents that you know, the COVID impacts are by no means behind us and something that a lot of parents and a lot of students are still struggling with and, and uh, witnessing every day. Um, but the top one among those who had heard something was just that reading scores and levels are behind. So then getting into the question of, of um, evidence-based, uh, the question that we were asking was basically, do you think it's already required to use evidence-based reading curriculum? And we found 41% saying that schools are required to do so, 18% who are aware that they're not currently required to do so, and a lot of parents who say that they don't know. So um, you can kind of look at that, lay this alongside of a lot, a lot of the other slides, which is, you know, there's parents have a lot of things on their minds, a lot going on, a lot going on even with schools and uh, are, are not particularly aware of either the level of um, the level of uh, the number of students who are not currently reading at expected levels or kind of what's required in the classroom right now. When you ask whether parents think that evidence-based reading methods should be required, this is where we see 84% saying either definitely yes, they should be required, or 38% saying probably yes, they should be required. So um, very high level of interest in having that requirement in place. And as we saw on the previous slide, many parents think that it's already in place. 
Um, so this was kind of interesting, which is basically just we wanted to know how parents understood and assessed the the, um, the reading progress that their children are displaying right now. And what we found was that mostly parents are relying on items linked to their child's teacher rather, rather than on standardized tests or uh, screeners of any kind. Um, so, for instance, grades and report cards, parent-teacher conferences, information from the teacher, conversations with the child, and so forth. Whereas, you know, when you do think about what we've looked at so far, it's, it, it makes sense that parents, by and large, aren't paying as much attention to the official sources that the, the stats that we've seen have been drawn from. So what this question was, was whether it was looking at the resources that are provided by schools for, for uh, children who need help with reading. And we see that, that the most common ones were either small group instruction or resources used at home to help, um, to help practice reading, a bit less likely to say one-on-one -on -one support from a specialist um, and kind of on, on down from there. This was a quote from somebody from one of our focus group participants, um, and that and uh, basically it's you know echoing some of the themes we've heard so far. It'd be nice to see where they are, right? Where they're supposed to be along that line, along that line for the reading level, compared to their classmates, compared to the standards, but also being able to see where they're dipping and where they're jumping ahead. Some parents have, um, <clears throat> have described measures that they've taken themselves. And the question was basically whether parents have looked for outside for help outside of school to support reading progress. Um, and we see that overall, one in four say that they've done so. Uh, parents of color are a bit more likely to say they've done so. That's the, the set of bars that you see right here with 20% 20, 20 of white parents and 30% or more of parents of color. Um, and then you also see parents who think their child is not currently at their expected level, just over half say that they've. Um, say that they have sought help outside of outside of the classroom. Um, <clears throat> this this quote over here on the left is from one of our one of our statewide focus groups. Half the people couldn't even attend her IEP meeting because they had to substitute for classes that had no teacher. And I paid out of pocket for a private private reading tutor since COVID. Um, so since 2020. And this echoes a theme we've heard a lot in the focus groups, just that you know parents are uh, do it, trying to do whatever they can, um, but often feeling like they're not receiving the support or that, that, that they ought to, or that they've had to fight for the support that their child uh, should be due. Um, another, another quote to that effect here on this slide, my concern is that the school is not teaching as they should. I do my own research and help my child, but the school curriculum is not as good. One other thing we asked about was uh, the frequency that pediatricians are discussing reading development with parents. And the question was basically whether that's ever happened. And you see 45% overall say yes, 51% say no, got a couple, few percent say don't know. But of those who did answer the question, it's about evenly split with um, just under half say, saying that their child's pediatrician has discussed it with them. Um, digging in on that a little bit more, we asked what kinds of activities or support the pediatrician recommended, and that by far the top two were just reading and reading with your child and talking with your child. Um, and we see kind of lower and lower percents for some of the other for some of the other ones. Um, I do know that I'm going quickly through these, and I would very again strongly encourage you to kind of take a look at our website if you want to dig in at them, dig in on them at a slower pace. One thing we've heard a lot in focus groups over the years too is just the, the struggle to get official diagnoses um, as far as what's going on, what's going on with your child, whether it's dyslexia or something else. And uh, so we just asked basically how long it, it, it took, you know, because sometimes that can be kind of the gate to getting the resources and assistance that are needed. And we see uh, just about a quarter said less than three months, another third said three to six months, and then overall, 37% said either about a year or more than a year. So certainly there's very long waits in some cases for, um, for, for di official diagnosis. Um, and then the, then, you know, the, fo the follow-up question was basically just whether there are any specific supports that parents are receiving. As I mentioned a minute ago, sometimes getting these supports can be the parents describe long processes and a bit of a battle and having to kind of stay on top of things. Uh, but 60% of the parents say, yes, they do get supports 
for dyslexia. And I should say this is among those who do have a, a child diagnosed with dyslexia. Just a couple more focus group quotes just to close us out. Um, <clears throat> and these, again, kind of echo some of the themes that we've heard so far. Uh, I'm, I'm satisfied with the progress, just not satisfied with the method. I don't know what method we're using. You know, that also echoes a theme that we heard throughout the focus groups, just that there's not a, not a ton of familiarity as far as the specifics are, are what happening, uh, the, the specifics of what's happening. Um, I'd appreciate it that the school can share more feedback with parents. They're floating through their classes because they're either on a waiting list or they can't get help because they need, be, they can't get the help they need because they don't have a doctor's note, even though the teacher might know what they need to do for this child, but they can't do it. Uh, so again, just strongly, loudly echoing a couple of the themes that we've heard throughout the, um, throughout the presentation. So that is a very, very quick tour through some of the poll results. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Shanti, but we'll be on for the remainder of the session. And I'm glad to answer questions either in the chat or at the end of the session. Thanks so much, Steve. There's certainly a lot to unpack from the data, which is a perfect segue for us to really have a conversation about what this really means for our students and families. Um, so we are now going to introduce Mandy McLaren from the Boston Globe to share um, and start a conversation about what comes next. Mandy's reporting for the Great Divide team has really helped to shine a light on the literacy crisis, inspiring action across stakeholders. Um, and we're really thankful to have Mandy moderating today's panels to really discuss what comes next with the panel of experts, Mandy. Thank you, Chanty. I'm so excited to be here. I love talking about literacy. One quick note of transparency that the Bar Foundation does also provide financial support to the Great Divide team, which is what I report for at the Boston Globe. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists, who I'm, again, so excited to chat with today. So you can go ahead and turn on your screens. And they are going to be sharing their experiences while reflecting on the poll results we just heard from Steve. And I'm going to give you each a chance to introduce yourself briefly. So let's start with Ariel, then Ron, then Catherine, and then Edith. Please share your name, role, and anything else you want the audience to know. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ariel Taylor-Smith. I'm the Senior Director of uh, Policy and Action at the National Parents Union. The National Parents Union supports parents across the country uh, as they navigate their kids' education journey. Um, and if there's one thing I want people to know on this panel is that I'm also a mom who has a child who's behind in reading, who's on his way to third grade. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mandy, I'm Ron. Oh, sorry, Ron, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mandy, I'm, I'm Ron Noble. I'm the Chief of Teacher Prep for the National Council on Teacher Quality, also known as NCTQ. Uh, we're the only national uh, organization, research organization focused exclusively on teacher quality. And immediately prior to this role, I was the deputy superintendent in Methuen, Massachusetts, where I led a lot of work uh, related to improving literacy outcomes for our students. Uh, and I'm also the dad of, of two young boys in the Boston Public Schools who are starting their reading journeys right now. All right. Good morning. I'm Catherine Torka. I'm, I'm the director of the Office of Literacy and Humanities at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, the work I do um, relates to ELA and literacy, as well as history, social science, civics, and the arts. Um, and I'm also the mom of three elementary school students in one of our gateway cities. Thank you, Mandy. Hi, everyone. My name is Edith Bazil. I am a native Bostonian who was inspired to become a teacher at 11 years old when I tutored my brothers who have dyslexia and found that they were so brilliant and had great skills that were not cultivated in their schools. I spent 32 years in Boston public schools as a special ed teacher, a literacy um, interventionist, as well as a, an administrator. And now I am the co-founder and executive director of Black Advocates for Educational Excellence. Thank you all. So grateful to have you here. Catherine, we're getting a little bit of an echo on your audio. Um, just if, I, I don't know if you 
know what that might be from. Um, but so excited to have you here. Your perspectives are so necessary for us to advance this conversation. And let's get started. I'm going to turn to the questions now. And, you know, the first thing I want to ask is really just what are your initial reactions to what you heard Steve go over today when it comes to parents' perceptions of their children's reading progress, their child's school's curriculums, and the state of the literacy crisis overall? What are your initial reactions? And this is an open question for everyone, but I'm going to start with with Edith. Great. Um, I, I think I, there are three takeaways. So I think there's an awareness gap. Um, parents obviously do not know that their child is not doing well. And I think there's a disconnect in terms of how parents see their children at home and how they are perceived at school. So what are the skills that are being missed in terms of creating that bridge to literacy when children transition from home to school? I think there's also an information gap. And the information gap is what are schools doing? What is the curriculum they're using? How do they perceive this literacy, um, uh, the accountability for ensuring that all students are reading? So parents are not getting that information. And lastly, I think it speaks to a trust gap. So when I tell my school, or when I find out that my child is not reading on level, how are the schools responding and what is the interventions that they are using that are evidence-based so that there's a, a close in that gap. And I think for black and Latino uh, parent, uh, parents of black and Latino students with disabilities and ELs, they are fleeing schools to find alternatives and they're getting extra support through after school programs. And that's not okay. There's a lot of work to be done here. I, I hope my audio is cleared up. Um, I'm gonna piggyback off Ia's great points. I was also really struck by the fact that 80% of parents think their child is meeting grade level expectations for reading. We know from our assessments, our early literacy screening assessments and our statewide MCAS assessment that, that that's not the case. So like Edith noted, the, um, the information gap that parents just aren't aware of the fact that their child may be behind in reaching meeting benchmarks or behind in learning to read. I was also really struck by the finding that about a quarter of parents in the survey said that they had sought outside help for the child's reading. That's a really large proportion. And it just goes to show how families in the Commonwealth really understand the importance of reading, um, believe that the child can be successful in this area, and they're going out to find help if they think that their child might not be getting the support that they need in school. I think families just really understand how important it is that their child be a strong reader for their future success. For me, the findings validated something that I observed uh, when I was in the district, which is that that parents still, you know, as as public faith in or faith in public institutions is sort of eroding across the country, there is still a tremendous amount of faith and trust between parents and their school and their teachers, and um, I think that's such an important opportunity for for school and district leaders to capitalize on. Like we have this this audience these partners that that believe what we say and we have to make sure we're we're telling them the right stuff we're telling them stuff often enough to help their children at home and that um we're not we're not uh, misusing or or taking advantage of that built-in trust that still exists between families and schools um you know in in, in my experience in Methuen the, the more we started to shift towards sharing objective information from assessments like those Catherine mentioned in her comments um, the more like sort of shock there was from parents about where their children actually were, but also the more interest there was in sort of digging in with teachers and saying, what can we do now? Now that we know this information, what can we do? Uh, and that's really important for schools to, to be able to make the progress we want for, for all kids. I think that transparency is so critical to how schools partner with parents. Um, I think, you know, and I know we're going to talk more about this, but I think the fact that 80% of parents in this poll 
in Massachusetts think that their student is on grade level, um, but really only 44% are, uh, is, as Edith said, a huge awareness gap that should be concerning um, to folks across the state because you know, if that's the case, all students are not being supported in the ways that they need to if they are behind. Um, and I, I think that, you know, Catherine, I, I think it's important to recognize that if 53% of students who are, um, are, if 53% of families are seeking outside assistance for reading, that to me feels like an indication that we need to do more to improve the systems within our schools that are supporting students and how they how they read. Yeah. Um, Ariel, I'm going to come back to you because we're on this notion of of educating parents and working alongside parents in this in in your advocacy, which you've done successfully at both the the state and district level. What have you learned from your experience? What lessons might we apply here in Massachusetts? Uh, so th there are so many states across the country who have adopted comprehensive literacy policy uh, that is, in fact, improving student outcomes for students so that these numbers actually do match, right? So that when 80% of parents think that their students are on grade level, 80% really are. Um, and that comes from changing policy. Um, and so there are three states that I'd just like to quickly highlight that are doing this well. Um, 32 states, though, have adopted comprehensive literacy policies. So that's noteworthy as Massachusetts continues to examine how they support their students from a policy perspective and at districts across the state. Um, but the three that I'd really like to talk through today are Minnesota. Um, in 2023, the legislature passed uh, reading to ensure academic development, the READ Act in 2023. Um, and this guaranteed uh, that students are, uh, receive support if they're not reading on grade level by third grade, which um, as many have mentioned is a critical moment. I should note that that had an $89 million appropriation attached to it. So not only is Minnesota um, investing in uh, reading by way of ensuring that districts are adopting high quality curriculum, evidence-based curriculum, they're supporting professional development, uh, and they're creating pathways to support students that aren't reading on grade level, um, but they're also putting their money where their mouth is. It's a, a generous appropriation from Governor Walls in Minnesota that I believe will uh, really initiate some needed growth in reading and students there. Um, in Tennessee, Tennessee uh, enacted the Literacy Success Act in 2021, which requires school districts to provide students in kindergarten through third grade literacy instruction based on the science of reading. We know that it's working in Tennessee. And the last state that I'll just quickly mention, and you all know this already, is Mississippi, um, who's really leading the way in this effort. Um, they passed the Literacy-Based Promotion Act in, um, in 2013, um, and that has resulted in um, in serious gains for Mississippi students. Um, Mississippi students uh, used to be fourth, uh, 49th in the nation uh, on reading scores for fourth grade, um, and now they are sitting at 21st. And I believe that that's the result of um, high quality policy changes that were initiated by parents who said that they were frustrated because their students weren't reading on grade level. Yeah, very important to highlight that um, with comprehensive policies, we are seeing a lot of funding coming with it. And Senator D. Domenico did bring up the budget amendment that um, Governor Healy has proposed for her five-year literacy launch plan. That would be $30 million in the first year if approved by the legislature next month. So we're all waiting to see about that. But I'm going to pivot to Edith. And your work has really shown a light on the lack of access to literacy interventions for Black students. You've also done a lot of work trying to improve literacy experiences for students with disabilities. What connections do you see between the literacy crisis and the growing number of students identified as having a learning disability? Unmute yourself. <laughs> Thanks. That's a great question. And I wanna give a shout out to Steve and the Mass Inc. polling group for really showcasing what the current data looks like and highlighting the fact that we do need new solutions. These solutions cannot be achieved without a strong school, family, community partnership. And I think that the data shows that that is what's lacking. If parents don't know, if we don't stop the use of a one-way track of education, which is schools know best, the expertise lies with schools, and develop parents as partners, true partners, um, collaborators in this work, 
and help parents understand and know what they can do at home because there is a lot that parents can do. Schools have students six hours a day. Parents have them 18 plus the weekend. And we are not utilizing the assets of what is happening and understanding what is happening at home. Uh, and we know that we fail certain populations. Um, it's important for us to remember that as we sit here, uh, we are 70 years beyond Brown versus Board of Education. We are um, 40 years past Boston desegregation and 30 years past ed reform. And, and, and we haven't had the innovation that is necessary. This is not, as Senator Domenico said, rocket science. We have the research. We understand what to do. We have decades of research that are not applied. Education continues to be a belief system and it's also a caste system where there is redlining in schools for black Latino students with disabilities and English learners. We sent them, we send them over there and don't consider them a part of the general population. And when we discover that students are failing at school, we don't use the tools that we already have. We have tools that where we can assess children in pre-kindergarten and find out where they are. We know that 20% of the population because of the research will struggle with reading in the typical way that schools teach it. And that's, that's one in five students. And yet we don't have reading specialists. We have a wait to fail model. And when students fail, they're frustrated, they're disconnected to school, they're discouraged, they're anxious. They have a whole host of other issues. And for black and brown students, if they show it through behavior, they are placed into sub-separate special ed classrooms. And we've seen that pattern happen over and over again. We can do something about it. We can use early screening, and but that's not enough. Once we get the results, we have to do something about it. And I ask, where are the reading specialists? If one in five students is prone to struggle, and we know from the research that only one to 6% of students have a true learning disability, just one to 6% and will struggle with reading throughout their lives. That's the vast majority of population if we use evidence-based strategies who can be taught to read proficiently by first grade. Waiting for third grade when the curriculum is decontextualized is too late. That's an old model, it's failed. And that's why we have such high numbers. We need to be preventative, proactive, and really get in there early and you utilize the research, the tools and strategies, but we also need to professionally prepare teachers and make sure that they understand and have the knowledge and skills to address the needs of every student in the classroom. That is something that we can do and must do to eliminate education, which has been a caste system. And also where we have the scarcity mentality of we can only educate students who are incidental learners who learn in the way schools have been constructed and designed, which is only for a small portion of students, we need to dismantle systems that don't work and, con and, and use innovation to create systems that will work. Edith, you surfaced a lot of policy issues in that in that one um, response, so I appreciate that very much, and including the role of reading interventionists. That has been something that, as you talk to researchers and look at other states and where they put their money, that has been um, a big piece of the change that we're seeing happen, and I want to shift to Ron now, and so we've been focusing on, on parents. What about school and district leaders? Um, in your prior role as assistant superintendent of Methuen Public Schools, you led work to improve literacy outcomes for all learners. Can you talk to us a bit about how you accomplished this and give any advice to current superintendents who, you know, the, and we got to think about the different buckets of those superintendents, right? Those that are all on board with evidence-based practices all the way to those that are very much opposed to some of the work that is going on in the state right now. So I'm going to ask you to sort of tackle <laughs> tackle all the buckets, Ron. Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I'll start by saying the, the work in Methuen is still very much a work in progress. You know, when I left the district in June, I felt pretty solid about where we were in terms of moving in the right direction. But, you know, it will take time in any district making this this amount of change to you know, see results in in uh, test scores or or other um, outcome metrics. But 
when when we thought about the work, um, we, we really we really tried to prioritize three main things. One, we wanted to make our commitment to um, improving literacy outcomes for all students really visible. So all of our most important documents, um, our strategic plan, our um, school committee memos, our school budget, um, it was really clear to everybody that we were really focused on literacy. And that meant, unfortunately, for some folks who had other interests, that some things were deprioritized. And that's hard in a district, but it's really vital. If you're, if, you're, if you're not producing third graders who are proficient readers, they can't go on to take all the other amazing courses that you might wanna offer. And they can't access the advanced math concepts that, that um, we might be excited to put in front of them. So making sure that, that it was really clear to everyone in our district, from parents and community members to, um, to teachers and, and administrators, that we were gonna be laser focused on early literacy was, was sort of step one. Um, step two is we needed to ensure that in every school building, we had literacy leadership. And that meant true literacy experts who were not just coaches, but in our case, were full-blown administrators focused on just literacy leadership. They oversaw the reading specialists. They organized all of our screening assessments. They, they crunched the numbers. They made intervention plans. They provided professional development and coaching. And they were evaluators for a cohort of teachers. And many of the teachers we placed under their, their uh, evaluatorship were folks that we had concerns were, were, you know, needed that rapid acceleration of skill. And so we wanted to put them with the best possible people to, to accelerate that, that growth in their practice. Um, and then I would say that the third, the third thing that we committed to was around our schedule, making sure that there was time in the day of every early literacy student to have access to the grade level content that is crucial for them but also additional time where they can access the type of reading supports that they might need. And this is a place where, you know, that, that public transparency in the schedule is something parents really picked up on and said, what is this new block in our schedule called reading success? What does this mean? What are we doing during this time? And that was a great opening because every parent is pouring over the schedule to make sure that, that you know, their child has access to all the all the pieces of the school program that, that they value. And so having parents dig in with us and say, okay, what's happening in reading success is we're using our screening data, which we're running three times a year to identify what types of supports your individual students need and making sure they have time with either a reading specialist or another classroom teacher who can provide that targeted small group instruction during that dedicated block of time that appears every day in the five-day schedule. And those three things together, I think really set up set us up for you know, some, some um, rapid uh, transition in practice and you know, helped us get all the teachers on board. Um, and you asked you know, advice to current su superintendents is, is find your internal champions. That's the final point I'll make is there are teachers in every district who have been reading on their own, taking grad courses on their own, listening to podcasts on their own, who are reading Mandy McLaren's reporting in the Globe, who are who are now well steeped in the science of reading and want that change for their students. They need to be found and empowered to help bring that bottom up pressure on the system. Um, that they certainly put pressure on me when I was in the leadership role, and I'm so thankful that they did. Um, in that first year, it was a lot of me learning from them what we should be doing and what we're doing that that shouldn't be happening anymore. Um, so th those those uh, internal people that are in every district can be super influential um, if you if you empower them and stand them up. Great, let's talk more about teachers, um, right? This None of this work can happen without them. And um, the question is, how did we get to this place? Are we preparing them to do the right thing? Um, I think no one here would say that teachers are at fault. And in fact, it's it's on the systems to to uplift them and support them moving forward. And I'm going to shift to Catherine. And um, when we look at our teacher prep programs in Massachusetts, um, by at least one ranking system, they have not been preparing teachers very well to teach children how to read. In 2019, uh, Desi launched its mass literacy initiative. And can you tell us more about that and how it is supporting to teachers both pre-service and in-service um, to be literacy champions for their kids? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Mandy. Um, and thanks for mentioning mass literacy. Um, for anyone who's not familiar, mass literacy is um, the Department of Education's umbrella name for all our work around evidence-based 
and culturally and linguistically responsive early literacy practices. This has been a focus at the department since about 2019 when it was articulated as one of our big um, literacy priorities for the state. 2019 was very early in the science of reading movement days. So we've been on this train for a while and we've been trying to help educators put evidence-based practices in place. Um, so to start with the educator preparation side that you mentioned, Mandy, um, DESE does review educator preparation programs. Part of DESE's um, uh, regulatory responsibility is to take a look at what's happening in higher education and educator prep programs and determine whether a program um, can license new teachers who um, wanna be licensed in areas like moderate disabilities or early childhood or elementary teaching. These programs have to meet certain criteria that are set by DESE. Typically those criteria have not been content specific. They're just looking across the whole prep program and how it prepares new candidates. Well, that changed this year. This year, DESE introduced new criteria that are specific to early literacy. And now educator prep programs are gonna have to demonstrate that their coursework and their field placements for young teachers match up with evidence-based and culturally sustaining criteria for early literacy that we've set. We've been working really hard with our ed prep programs to prepare them for this. It's a big change. Um, a lot of um, ed prep uh, partners have been leading the way, helping each other, sharing resources. Um, some of the programs are already doing really excellent work in this area and can be a model for others. Um, and the formal reviews will start this coming year. So programs will, will really have to demonstrate that they can meet these criteria and that they're well preparing their new candidates. Um, in terms of teachers that are already in the classroom, um, we at the department provide a lot of supports for in-service teachers. Over the last few years, we've really focused our in-service support in two areas, helping school districts and teachers get their hands on high quality curriculum materials and helping teachers bolster their knowledge and their skills when it comes to evidence-based literacy practices. So oftentimes just the financial barrier to changing literacy approaches can be um, a serious impediment. So over the last few years, we've offered quite a few grant programs to schools and districts really to help the schools purchase new materials or replace materials that they may have been using that were out of date. Um, so a lot of school districts have been able to acquire high quality um, instructional materials, which embed all the evidence-based and culturally sustaining practices we know students need over the last couple of years. We've seen over and over that when we offer this type of support, school districts really come for it. They take advantage of it. We often have more districts going for these opportunities than, than we can support with the available amount of funding, which is a great sign in terms of the movement. And we've also offered a lot of professional development to teachers. Whenever a district uses DESE support to get a new curriculum, we always help them with professional development costs as well, because we know it, it doesn't really help a teacher to drop 12 new boxes of curriculum in their room and say, you know, good luck, read it over the summer. So we try to support them with really great collaborative learning opportunities as well. And um, DESE has also offered professional development courses to individual teachers at no cost. So even if their district isn't exposing them to cutting edge evidence-based early literacy practices, we're covering the coursework costs for teachers to access that learning on their own. Although we don't believe they should have to access that learning on their own, it should be supported in their workplace. We're making it available for people um, who wanna be champions and who wanna extend their knowledge. And I just really wanna mention um, the governor's literacy launch proposal that you referenced, Mandy. We're excited about the opportunities that that um, new initiative will present if it does pass and it is funded by the legislature. Um, the literacy launch funding will allow us to support both um, teachers that are being prepared as well as in-service teachers with a, a higher level of support and resources. Um, we're really excited about that um, opportunity. Great. You guys killed it round one of questions. We're going to move to round two and we have about 10 minutes left for the panel. So if you could just keep your answers um, concise, but powerful. Um, we'd appreciate it. And I'm going to go back to Ariel for um, the work that you do with the NPU where literacy is a policy priority. Can you tell us a bit about the Read to Rise campaign and its early success in raising awareness and really help us tease out what are the, the key steps to improving this communication between parents and schools? 
Yes. Uh, so National Parents Union uh, has launched our Read to Rise campaign, uh, which is a campaign to support parents who are advocating for changes to improve how students are learning to read um, in their districts, in their states, and um, critically at a federal level. Um, and so we are very excited to, you know, both educate parents about the literacy crisis, as this poll indicated, uh, once parents know that there is a literacy crisis, they become concerned. And so we know that giving parents clear data about how students are doing is critical. Um, we have, uh, you know, mapped that out and evaluated uh, curriculums in each of the states that's on our website, nationalparentsunion.org. Uh, and, you know, in addition to the information, we also believe that it's important to pair this with real solutions. Um, I think it was Edith who said, like, we know how to do this. Like, we know how to improve reading scores and we know how to set our kids up for a lifetime of opportunity if they know how to read. Um, the, the, the thing that's necessary is making changes um, that are sustainable um, and that are supportive of our teachers, as you mentioned, Mandy, uh, and that support students who are currently behind. Uh, and so Read to Rise, uh, we have a policy paper on our website that gives folks a background on the science of reading and evolution um, and uh, gives information about the three states I referenced earlier. Um, but we really believe that this is an all hands on deck moment. This is a national crisis. This is not just something specific to Massachusetts. Two thirds of fourth graders across the country are not reading on grade level. Um, and that score is a 20 year low. Um, so that we're, you know, putting that in context. This is something that deserves national attention. We believe that there's more that the federal government can be doing to support states, including funding, as Catherine mentioned. So we continue to advocate uh, for programs at a federal level, like the Comprehensive Literacy Grant Program that supports states as they're building out evidence-based practices and plans. Um, and so, yeah, very excited about our Read to Rise campaign. Uh, please follow us on Twitter because that's where we give most of our updates at, at National Parents. Thank you. And Edith, turning back to you, the, the achievement gaps are quite appalling, right? Um, for our students with disabilities, students of color, students still learning English. And you brought up some policy solutions earlier, like early screening, um, can't just identify a kid, need to actually give them the extra support. Are there any other things that come to mind um, for you when we are moving forward and really wanting to tackle those achievement gaps? Yeah, so uh, this is not a, teach a teacher problem. This is a systems problem. I want to highlight that we have islands of excellence that are not scaled. We often focus on failure and we target the wrong thing instead of looking at where are the failures? We need to look at where are the successes and we need to scale those islands of excellence across the district. But what we do is we burn teachers out and professional learning is critical. Teachers do not go into this profession to fail students. They go in into it as a mission. And so if we look at our policies and the infrastructures that are created, often teachers have their hands behind their back. And, and we don't have enough talk about, you know, what does, what is required to have a successful school? Uh, teachers are also advocates. They advocate against the system in which they work and they advocate for what they need. Um, we, we don't have enough, we don't have teachers who represent the demographic population of students. So teacher diversity is an issue. We need a multicultural dynamic force where students see themselves represented in the classroom. We need to decolonize the curriculum and begin to teach history accurately so that students see positive, resilient, resourceful, and impactful contributions that have come from people who look like them. That's really important. We need to create an infrastructure for professional learning where knowledge is shared. Often we say that teaching is the second most private act adults engage in. We need to open the doors of collaboration and share what works. Uh, and we can do that. We know that we can go across school districts and across states from the pandemic. And why aren't we utilizing the best examples of effective literacy instruction um, that leads to a community of practice, a professional learning community? We need to celebrate students' uh, cultures and embed it in the curriculum and implement 
a model of restorative justice that leads to healing and repairing of those populations that we continually, continually have left behind. We need to stop the redlining in school districts where black and brown students are stared to underfunded, understaffed, and chronically underperforming schools because they have teachers who are new and don't have the experience and the skill set, but yet they're given students that have the most complex issues. And we burn those teachers out early in their career. We need to eliminate the deficit model of thinking when we talk about students and we call students marginalized when we, when we don't challenge systems that create the marginalization. We need to change that. We need to look at discipline, how students are referred to special ed. They're either overrepresented if they're Black or they're underrepresented, for example, if they speak a second language because we don't have Native instruction that really cultivates the gifts and talents that students have in their Native language. Instead of referring to students at, at risk, we need to dismantle systems that create these disparities. I would end by saying that Gloria Ladson Billing said it well when she said that we have marginalized students over and over, and we need to acknowledge that we owe a debt to students and stop calling this an achievement gap because these gaps are created by policies. They are policies that create these gaps, and we need to dismantle and decolonize our thinking about students and what they bring to the table and understand that students have cultural ways of knowing, funds of knowledge, and bodies of information that are not represented by this system that has not been redesigned to embrace the diversity that exists in our student population and still has the colonial remnants of a district that was started in 1635 where black students were and black people were still enslaved for another 150 years. It's only been uh, you know, a short time where it was illegal to teach black people to read. And we need to restore and create new systems and structures that ensure literacy and use the research that we, we have at our fingertips. Edith. Coming through, bringing all of those threads together is really powerful, and I just really appreciate that. Um, Ron, your work at the National Council for Teacher Quality has allowed you to look to other states and promising uh, policy. Um, what are some things that we should be taking away from what other states are doing? Thanks, Mindy. Yeah, we, we did a, a national review looking at, um, I'll start with just teacher prep. Uh, over almost 700 teacher prep programs nationwide. And um, in Massachusetts, we found that 68% of the teacher prep programs that we reviewed are still teaching practices that run counter to the research that would be misaligned to the science of reading. So Catherine talked about the really strong new prep approval standards that Desi's going to be rolling out. And we, we, we reviewed those as well and found them to be very strong. And we're optimistic that that will help. It's just about the timeline. How many hundreds of teachers are going to be entering the workforce before DESE has a chance to review all those programs and remediate that um, those, those deficiencies in programming? How many hundreds of teachers are going to then be entering our classrooms with mismatched knowledge? Um, uh, you know, that's one one big area of concern. And in many other states, you know, they've gone down a similar path of setting strong standards and holding programs accountable. So again, we are optimistic about that approach, but just worried about the timeline. And then um, when it comes to in-service educators, you know, the biggest area of deficiency we found in Massachusetts, which was echoed in the Globe reporting, um, is that 40% of, of districts in Mass are still using what we would deem low quality literacy curriculum. Not what we would deem, what DESE would deem. Um, low quality literacy curriculum. And that's a major problem. And a lot of the initiatives that we've talked about today are, are um, loaded with carrots. They're, they're helping good actors do great work, uh, but none of those are gonna get at the folks that are just willfully resisting aligning to the science of reading. And so we have strong concern that there's nothing in the policy ecosystem right now in Massachusetts that forces a district to protect students from poor instructional materials. Um, so that's that's one piece that that I think I'll end with there. Thank you. And 
Catherine, the last question to you. The data showed that parents are less familiar with what evidence-based literacy curriculum entails, but when presented with information on what the research shows is most effective, they think that evidence-based curricula should be required in schools. Um, could you speak a little bit more about what DESE has been doing to encourage evidence-based curricula? And just remind us that DESE does not have the authority to, to mandate it at this point, correct? That's right. Um, Massachusetts is a local control state, so our districts have the right to choose what curricular materials they're going to use and what instructional approaches they're going to use. So a, a lot of parents in the survey that, and the data Steve shared were pretty surprised that a lot of districts may not have adopted evidence-based practices yet and wish that it was mandated. That's not something that we can do with our current structure. But um, I think we we all hear, it, it sounds like we all agree, and Desi also agrees very strongly that evidence-based practices that work the best for our students need to be used. And we've been doing everything we can in the way of incentives and support and communication um, and provision of resources to advance those evidence-based practices as much as we can, acknowledging that the control around those decisions is ultimately local. Um, I mentioned earlier all the grants, the training, the materials that DESE has been offering um, since evidence-based early literacy was announced as a priority six years ago. So many districts have, um, and schools and educators have taken advantage of those offerings and those resources. I feel that we really have seen a sea change in the last five years in the extent to which evidence-based early literacy practices are used in our state really rising and the the use of discredited or old-fashioned approach is really falling off. Um, it's not changing as fast as we would like. Uh, we would all like it to, we would like to be 100% evidence-based practices at this point and we're not there, but we really are changing rapidly. Um, in addition to the, the supports and offerings that I've already mentioned, I just wanted to mention Curie the Curie Project. The department has this tool called Curie that provides teacher-led reviews of different curriculum materials. So even though districts have their uh, have control of their curriculum choices, DESE is trying to make it as easy as possible for district leaders and educators to know which curricula are built with evidence-based practices, which curricula do represent diverse perspectives so that districts can make an informed decision about what they're purchasing. Before Curie, you know, I, I was a district leader. We pretty much relied on Googling, talking to neighboring district leaders or teacher friends, sales pitches. Those days are in the past. We have rating systems now to know which curricula are built with evidence-based and culturally sustaining practices, and we need to be using those tools. Um, and Literacy Launch is gonna allow us to expand uh, all these resources, expand these efforts and, and reach more districts, which is why we're so enthusiastic about that hopefully coming. Great, and thank you to all of our panelists for such a rich conversation today. I'm gonna invite Steve to turn his camera back on as we move into the audience Q&A, just in case anybody has some questions specifically about the data. And from the, the questions that I can see here is a hot topic is the legislation um, that would require evidence-based reading instruction in Massachusetts public schools, would, which would do what, essentially what DESE right now cannot do on its own. Um, we don't have any lawmakers on the call, but I just wanted to open the floor to anyone that has strong feelings about the legislation or could give us an update about where it stands. Sorry, um, I don't know that I have much of an update. I know it's it's currently sitting with the Senate and it's their, you know, their prerogative to take it up and, and vote on it or not. Um, we are uh, NCTQ and, and a local coalition of advocacy organizations of which some of our panelists here today are part of, are um, pushing hard to make sure that the that the bill gets its chance to be heard. Um, and the main the main piece for me that is that is critically important is this backstop that we're talking about, which is giving Desi the authority to say you cannot subject students to curriculum that is misaligned to the research, um, which feels like pretty low hanging fruit. And I don't understand why this isn't a really easy thing for legislators to get behind and push through. I know there's been some resistance from from superintendents and and teachers associations. 
And I, I just think that that resistance is misplaced. There's this narrative out there that it means it's going to be, you know, forcing uh, forcing folks to choose from a really narrow list of materials. And to Catherine's point, with the amount of information we now have about what materials are evidence aligned and what aren't, there are some really interesting and diverse choices um, in the basket of good. And, and I think that just constraining choice to the basket of good is a great thing for our kids and taking bad options off the table. You know, I don't understand why that's even remotely controversial. I'd like to echo that statement and just say that we're sort of in a Plessy versus Ferguson moment where we know that separate is not equal. And we have evidence that what we have been doing and giving schools choices to continue to use bad curriculum is failing generation after generation of students, and they are not gaining access to, not even, you know, it contributes to chronic absenteeism. It, it reduces the graduation rate, access to college and career, which leads to homelessness and unemployment, food insecurity, health disparities, and we as a society pay for all of that. And so I think this is such a no brainer. What do we need to do to overturn a system that has not been working when we have the solutions on the other side and evidence that this is not going to happen out of will. It has to be mandated. If it's not mandated, we are going to be stuck with a belief system that exists in education that some students are hardwired to learn and others are not. And, and we are reducing our society's capital in terms of future leaders who could contribute to society. So you know, anybody on this call, anything that I can do to join you, I am here. Reach out. I will be front and center in that fight because we all have to stand up for what's right for our kids. Catherine, I'm going to give you a few rapid fire questions, if that's OK, because there's a few directed at you and we have a couple minutes left. Um, can you just talk through briefly um, where we sometimes stumble talking with each other using reading on grade level versus MCAS scores and, and what should we really be, what should the conversation really be about? When we talk about early reading achievement, we usually talk about data results from our early literacy screening assessment or from MCAS. So um, it became required this school year for all students in grades two to two to be assessed with an approved early literacy screening instrument. These are basically tests of basic reading abilities that teachers use to see which children are on track to be successful as readers and which are not on track to not be successful so that those children can be given extra help matched to their needs right away. Um, all students in K-2 in Massachusetts um, should be assessed with that type of instrument at least twice a year now that's required by this regulation. So data from those instruments will tell us if a student is on track to be a successful reader, or you can say reading on grade level for grades K to two. And then of course we have MCAS, which is given in third grade. It measures not just basic um, reading ability, you know, reading fluency, but also reading comprehension, analysis and writing. So in some ways the MCAS is an even higher bar. It takes into account a larger suite of literacy skills. And of course, we want all students to be able to be proficient on that suite of literacy skills by the end of third grade. A yes or no question. Do you anticipate that a substantial part of that $30 million, if passed, will support districts in making a curriculum shift, whether through materials or training support? We're still working on exactly how we use the literacy launch funding, if passed, but I would anticipate yes. And there was a question also about early uh, early education, which I know is not your department, but I do believe literacy launch is age three through grade three, correct? That's right. And the governor has been um, really passionate and energetic about bringing early childhood into the literacy work, a collaboration that hasn't always been the case. I've had the opportunity to work really closely with leaders of the Department of Early Education and Care these last few months as we talk about how do we uplift literacy, not just in kindergarten through grade three, not just in our public schools, but actually starting with three-year-olds and children that are um, attending pre-K in any type of program, not just a public school program. It's been really exciting. I think bridges that haven't always been there are being built. Um, and we do intend to support preschoolers across all different types of programs. Um, with literacy launch if it were to pass. 
And I'm going to call an audible here with a final question because we are at time and ask each of the panelists to just take a second here to think of one word that encapsulates where you think the state needs to be moving as we go forward in this. What is one word that you hope um, embodies the, the continued conversation? One word's really hard, but I'm going to say partnerships. I'll say it's possible, possible. I would say innovate. And I'll go with engagement. Wonderful, you all were so great. And also thank you to Steve who came back on for us. Uh, you were wonderful panelists, a great conversation. I do apologize we couldn't get to all of the audience's questions, but I know that everyone on this call is, is um, open and available. Um, in, in their professional um, spheres. And I'm gonna switch it back to Chanti and just thank you so much for letting me uh, moderate today. Thank you, uh, Mandy, for moderating and, and um, for all the panelists, extremely powerful and informative uh, panel. And I uh, love all the words that you all shared to close us out. Um, for our last uh, and next, our next and last speaker is a former teacher and lifetime resident of Holyoke where he served for 13 years on the school committee. He was instrumental in forming the Holyoke Early Literacy Initiative, which really focused on increasing the number of students proficient, proficient in reading by the third grade. Now he serves as a member of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'd like to invite Mike Morardi on the screen to offer insightful reflections on the poll, um, in the poll and also on the state um, of uh, literacy and the intersections of policy and education. Thank you so much, and, and thanks to uh, Mass Inc. and the uh, Ed Trust for, uh, first of all, creating this poll and sharing this information with us, uh, but also uh, this, this opportunity to speak. Uh, I always like to just make sure I've uh, made it clear. Uh, when I'm speaking in a forum like this, I, I'm not speaking for the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, nor for DESE. Uh, the, the opinions are my own. Uh, so the this poll is centered on the premise that there is a reading crisis in Massachusetts. Uh, amazingly, during the time that I have watched the uh, debate unfold in Massachusetts about a literacy law, uh, there are people who will argue that that's manufactured, that there is not a crisis in Massachusetts. And it, it just boggles the mind to hear it. Uh, understanding the reality of a crisis begins and ends by paying attention to the data. But it also requires learning a lot about what it takes to know how to read. First of all, we do know a lot. Secondly, uh, there's a lot of information in the last 10, 15 years that didn't exist prior to that uh, that's been incredibly difficult to transmit to our workforce, to our administrators. It's It's a it's been a long, slow, and difficult process, and there's been there's been a lot of controversy um, swirling around it. And meanwhile, last year, the majority of third graders aren't reading proficiently, and, and we know this, and it's we can see it through the EdCAS MCAS scores, but it's verified by the national test NAEP that has very similar outcomes, and it's verified by the internal data that we're seeing. Uh, with our screeners, with our district results, that we we can, you know, very clearly see there's there's a lot of work to do. But meanwhile, we know, done right, almost all kids can learn to read. Some with greater difficulty and less, uh, and and others with uh, more uh, ease. But all kids can do it. The vast majority of kids need to have very good instruction, um, and yet. Most kids go into the fourth grade not proficient in reading, uh, and it was barely a majority before COVID. And that's in Massachusetts, and we're the best in the nation in terms of outcomes. This is a crisis that undermines children's lives as they move forward into the grades. If you're subliterate as an adolescent and as a pre-adolescent, we already know this is going to haunt your academic success. It's going to haunt your social and emotional experiences in school. It's going to uh, undermine your economic prospects and be a, a a millstone for the rest of your life. How can that not be a crisis? 
we also know that when we tested in 2013, uh, there were 938 schools that administered the third grade ELA MCAS. Out of those, 566 uh, reported that less than half of their third grade students were proficient. That meant that less than half of their students the next year, and they almost all progressed to fourth grade, um, were not ready for a fourth grade curriculum. And if you look at the third to eighth grade data, it stays that way all the way through until you are dropping thousands and thousands of adolescents into ninth grade classrooms thoroughly unprepared for high school. How, how is that not a crisis? There is a crisis. That is That, that premise is, is valid. And when you hear uh, opponents, whether they're coming out of ed schools or uh, administrative offices or, uh, you know, the leadership of collective bargaining agencies, all of whom are making these arguments, uh, you should be wary. You should be ready to push back, I think. It's very important. And starts and ends with the data. We've got the evidence. We've got the knowledge. Uh, we know what works and we know it's not being done. There are no better advocates than parents. And I think that is another important uh, aspect of this poll and an important takeaway. When parents get better information, they become stronger advocates. Nowhere have I seen this more clearly than when I speak to the family members of children who are identified with dyslexia. It wasn't that far ago in the past school districts would deny dyslexia even exists. Uh, we now have a much greater understanding, a much greater capacity to move away from what uh, a lot of families experience, which is this wait to fail uh, belief that kids will eventually catch up. They will, uh, they'll, they, everybody learns on their own path. That, that's, that's not entirely so. Uh, and if a child really does have a neurological, uh, you know, is, is, uh, has a, uh, a an identifiable reason uh, to need specific care. The sooner we learn that, the better. It took a long time, and it was only recently that we created a regulation so kids can properly be screened. I think that's going to help thousands and thousands of kids every year. It's also going to help us to become more savvy about the work we do for kids who are not uh, neurodivergent, but actually um, have suffered because of a failure of instruction. Uh, we're, we're on a good path. There's a lot of reason for optimism. And the fact that parents are learning more, are seeing more, and the media is telling us more is incredibly helpful. Uh, I'll just finish with this last note. The literacy launch is looking like it's on a positive trajectory in the legislature. We hope that that will continue to be the case. The bill that you've heard spoken of that is currently being considered in the Ways and Means Committee uh, that's more challenging. That's where more opposition has arisen. Uh, all we want to do is give our state agency, which is already five years ahead of the curve, better capacity to give districts the technical support and the um, uh, guidance that they need to get it right and get it right in the beginning. So Hopefully, we can join the majority of states and, and have a solid uh, early literacy law. Uh, thank you all very much for your time today and the opportunity to share this. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us for your leadership. And I think um, closing us out with really underscoring, I think, two points that um, was definitely shared throughout. One, one being that when parents are really armed with uh, critical information, they're the biggest advocates. Um, and the second being, indeed, that we do have a crisis, but that we do have a roadmap. Uh, we know what, what has worked in other states. Um, we just have to be willing to collectively come together and do the work. So uh, thank you again. Um, this is all the time that we have for today. Thank you for um, all of our speakers today. Um, thank you, of course, for all of you um, for joining and watching. Um, keep out, uh, keep, keep an eye out for future polls from the Mass Inc. They will continue to put out polls on a variety of different topics, um, as well as another um, education poll in the near future. As a reminder, if you missed um, any of today's um, discussion, uh, the recording, as well as the presentation, which many of you asked about in the chat, will be available at both um, EdTrust that, um, slash Massachusetts in the Massing polling group. Um, I also want to close out by saying once again, thank you to the Bar Foundation for your support. Thank you again to the audience for joining us and have a good day.